Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, January 17, 2021. Its focus is on the necessity of spiritual change over and above any religious ritual. The message to all who will listen is repent of your sin and follow God. Now here is Pastor Mike Neifert. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy, grace, everything that you've offered to us, and we thank you that your wrath has been satisfied by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross so that those who believe in you can have eternal life. We don't have to die in our sin, but we can live in righteousness, the righteousness that you give us by faith. And I pray, God, today that you would encourage us in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. So around every holiday on Facebook, someone is going to put this a post like this. It's going to be like ruin Thanksgiving dinner or ruin Christmas dinner or Easter dinner or whatever holiday is. Ruin dinner in five words or less. And uh, the responses are often comical. A few are poignant and a few are political as well. These days, the easiest way to ruin a family gathering or a church potluck. Remember those? The easiest way to ruin a family gathering or a potluck these days is to say, President Trump is the greatest or Joe Biden is going to unite us, right? Am I, am I not right? That's going to divide. Oh, man. Those are the kinds of things that we could just cause all sorts of controversy and all kinds of strife sitting there at the table, unless we just happen to all agree, which hardly ever happens, right? So, uh, my all-time favorites, and this I, I'm going to admit that these are more than five words, my all-time favorites, and people post this all the time, you can't be a Christian and vote Republican, or you can't be a Christian and vote Democrat. And that's not true, right? If you are following Jesus, you need to follow your conscience, and you need to follow what God's told you to do, and leave his, his leading to, of other people to, the, to him, right? All right, so now... There's an old rule of thumb in conversations to maintain decorum and polite company, and it's probably wisely followed, and that is never talk about politics or religion, right? And I've already talked about uh, religion, so I, might, I mean about politics, so I might as well just make a few ripples religiously as well. So it seems strange to me, but one of the topics that often divides the church is the issue of baptism. It just does. Denominations point fingers at each other and shout heresy over minor variances in practice and belief and all sorts of things. They get all upset about whether you're dunked or sprinkled or hosed down or whatever. Bible verses are used to stab and jab brothers and sisters in Christ. Unity becomes elusive when the topic arrives. Pastors part company over the smallest differences. Ugh! Interestingly, a Lutheran friend of mine posted a 10-minute video about his denomination's understanding of baptism this week. It popped up on my Facebook feed early in the morning on Tuesday, and I watched and I learned some things about his views on baptism that I didn't know. And I, I thanked him for posting it because it's good when brothers and sisters understand each other better, right? Even if we don't agree it's still better to, to at least understand what they actually teach. So imagine my joy when I picked up my Bible and looked at Matthew chapter 3 and found out that this week I get to preach about baptism. Woohoo! There was great rejoicing. Yay. Well, after I started reading this passage and praying over it, I found that my dread over this topic diminished just a little bit. In fact, I got a little bit excited about the things that God teaches us through this chapter. And so I'm, I'm hoping that as we look at this chapter, you're going to get the essence of the good news. You're going to see direction on, on the way that you ought to live. And most importantly, we're going to hear truth about Jesus because that's why we're, we're looking at Matthew this year and why we're going to go into Mark. We're going in the Gospels because we want to understand who Jesus is, right? We want to know him, not just about him, but to, to experience him and to know him. And so we, we uh, are going to talk about that this year. That's the aim. 
as we read Matthew, as we read Mark, as we read it over and over, I'd encourage you to just read a different translation each week, maybe. You know, find different ways to look at it. Maybe one week you're going to look at the commentaries and read through those. There's plenty of those available online as well. And just get immersed into the Gospels so we know Jesus better and better. So, if you haven't already done so, turn to Matthew chapter 3. And it's always important to follow along with the preacher because you want to make sure that he's not going astray and telling you stuff that's not actually true, right? That is true all the time. You need to check my words. You need to check everybody on TV that you listen to or on the radio. You need to check it. Never accept truth from anyone without asking the Spirit for discernment. You must not be deceived. Now, I promise not to intentionally lead you astray, but you should still listen to me with your ears tuned into God's still small voice. Make sure that what I'm saying out loud and what the Spirit's saying to your heart, that they match up, that there's no disagreement there. Now, I want you to understand that no one sermon is going to be able to cover any topic generally. And so we're going to talk about baptism today, focusing mostly on what it says here in Matthew 3. And we're going to actually not cover a lot of the super controversial passages. I'm just telling you, I'm not ducking anything. I just, we don't have time to cover everything. And so we're going to look at Matthew 3. Perhaps we'll deal with the other stuff some other time when God leads that way. But we're going to look today at Matthew 3 and gain some insight into what's happening through this passage. So we're ready to read. We're going to start with the first six verses, and these few sentences introduce us to one of the main baptizers in the New Testament. His name is John. Right. We call him John the Baptist because that's what he did, mostly, right? He appears at the beginning of all four Gospels. He's an important player in the advancement of the good news, and so let's read Matthew 3, 1 to 6. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he, this is talking about John, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So what is John's main ministry? It's not preaching, though he does that, right? It's not baptizing, though again, he does that. His main thing is preparing people to meet the Lord preparing them to enter into God's kingdom, which he says is at hand. It's close. Isaiah had predicted that John would come. You saw that verse right there in the middle uh, in chapter, verse 3. Isaiah saw that there was a prophet that was going to come that was not unlike himself, who would point people to the Savior. There would be this man who would come calling people to get right with God. And that's what we have here in verse 3, is that prediction that Isaiah made. The work of the prophet, this is a generalization, the work of the prophet called by God and empowered by the Spirit is to point people to God. There he is. Go follow him. Read Isaiah or Jeremiah or Daniel or any of the minor prophets' writings as we did last year as we were reading through the Bible together, and you'll see it. The message is almost universally one of repentance. Those who warn of judgment urge their hearers to turn away from their sin and turn to God and follow him. This, my friends, is the essence of anyone's relationship with our holy God. All who would be a friend of God's must reject their sin and embrace his ways. Repentance is the way to peace with God. And so John preached that message. He invited people to turn away from their sins and from all over they came. All these people came and heard the message and did as John urged. Did you catch that they confessed their sins and were baptized? They confessed their wrongdoing? Baptism then was this visible sign of repentance, of turning away from sin and turning to God. Those who went into the water did so to publicly indicate that they had made a decision to turn from sin and to follow God. I might say it again. In fact, I know I'm going to because I wrote the whole sermon. But it definitely needs to be said, baptism without repentance is useless. 
Being immersed in water cannot change a heart. Did you know that? I mean, I've taken several baths in my lifetime, and being immersed in water didn't change my heart. Only those who have rejected sin and trusted God for salvation are freed from its power. We know that the forgiveness that we seek comes by faith in Jesus, right? I think I've said that a few times over the past 10 years. We know that salvation comes by faith in Jesus. This wasn't true for the people of John's time yet, because Jesus hadn't died yet, right? But he was getting them ready to follow the one who would die for their sin. He was preparing them for faith in Jesus. This truth is made even clearer in John's account of this very same event. And I'm going to read just a short snippet of John's words from John chapter 1, and then we're going to flip over to John chapter 3, so I'm just giving you a warning. And then we're going to come back to Matthew So don't lose Matthew 3. I don't know how you're going to keep track of all that, but we're going to go to John chapter 1 right now. This is the way that John tells the story about John the Baptist, uh, about the one who came to proclaim that he was preparing the way for the Messiah. So I'm reading John chapter 1, verses 35 to 37. It says, The next day John was there again with his two disciples, When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Sometime later, John was questioned about Jesus. The folks around him knew that Jesus and his disciples were also baptizing. They mentioned everyone was going over to Jesus. And how did John respond? Listen to these words. We're in chapter 3 now. John chapter 3, verses 27 through 30, says this. A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, John said, and it is now complete. He, that is Jesus, must become greater and I must become less." I said it earlier, let me repeat myself. John's job was to prepare others for faith in Jesus. He didn't want followers for followers' sake. He wasn't trying to get a whole bunch of people to follow him on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. He wanted only to point his hearers to the Savior. When Jesus came on the scene, John shouted, follow him. And then he faded slowly into the background. Jesus moved front and center. All right, I think we've said enough about that first section of Matthew chapter 3, so let's read just a bit more. We catch a glimpse of the seriousness of John's message as we read verses 7 through 10. This is Matthew 3, 7 through 10. It says, But when he, John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Obviously, John had not read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. This is not how you become popular, right? You've got to say kind things and be nice. But the task of the prophet is not to say nice things and to be nice, but to speak the words of God. The task of the prophet is to cut to the chase. The messenger of God must speak the truth no matter how harsh it may seem. Sin is a, is a serious problem. Did you know that? Sometimes we like to play around with ours, right? We think ours is not so bad, but that other person over there, they are horrible. All right. Sin must be repudiated. If you do not turn away from sin and fall on God's mercy, it will lead to your eternal undoing. That's how serious sin is. John, with the help of the Spirit of God, knows what's in the hearts of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who have come out to where he is. They are not repentant. They have little fear of God. They smugly imagine themselves as holier than the rest of them. If God grades on a curve, they are sure they're in. 
to those with this attitude, God's message is clear. God's wrath toward sin is going to fall on everyone who is not repentant. Your destruction is sure unless you turn away from sin. The ax, he says, is at the root of the trees. And every tree that doesn't produce fruit is going to be cut down and thrown in the fire. Did you notice what John says to these religious bigwigs about the repentance? He said it would show itself in how the repenter's life changes. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. I remember the words of a woman who shared her testimony with us during chapel service when I was in Bible college. She spoke of her own baptism with water. She submitted to immersion because her friends were doing it. She hadn't repented. She hadn't put her faith in Christ. She was just going along with the crowd. She said in her post-baptismal state, this is what she told us in chapel, she said, I went into the water a dry sinner and came out a wet one. She then told how God worked in her life to bring her to faith in Jesus apart from works. I said it right. Baptism without repentance is useless. Being immersed in water cannot change a heart. Only the indwelling of the Spirit of God, which comes by faith, can make any person a new creation. It's the Spirit who produces fruit in a person's life. God help us, right? We need God's spirit or we're going to live by our flesh and its desires and we're going to make a mess. We're going to live by trusting in worthless religious ritual rather than in the Son of God. You know, this is the core message of the Friends Church. Spiritual reality will suffice apart from ritual. Ritual without spiritual reality is worthless. Faith that saves is in Christ alone, not in baptism or communion or reciting prayers or wearing a prayer shawl or anything. Faith in Jesus alone. That's what saves. We've only read part of what John said to the religious leaders. So let's go on in verses 11 and 12 and let him finish up what he has to say to them. So we're back in Matthew chapter 3. This is verses 11 and 12. John said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So how many baptisms are there mentioned in these verses? Two, right? John's baptism which was with water for repentance, the Holy Spirit, and fire baptism, which comes from Jesus. Which does John consider greater? It's Jesus' baptism. Jesus' baptism with the Spirit and with fire is the essential, is vital. Without his baptism, there is no salvation. So, is water baptism necessary then? This is the debate that's raged for centuries, right? Some say that the act is most definitely needed. There are churches that teach the act of dunking a person in water is what washes away their sin. Without water, there's no forgiveness. I had a friend who was a pastor uh, of such a church years ago. We talked semi-regularly about all sorts of things, and baptism came up one day. He, in all seriousness, said something like the following. You are probably more moral than I am. It's too bad you're going to hell because you haven't been water baptized. Well, hello. I was dumbstruck. I didn't imagine that anyone thought like this. Maybe it was just because I've been raised a Quaker and was still in a Quaker church. I don't know. Listen, I recognize my need of a Savior. Absolutely. I am not at all righteous apart from Christ's work in my life. Absolutely not. It is his death that has paid the penalty for my sin. This I believe with all my heart, and I am totally dependent upon God and his grace for my salvation. I do my best to daily submit to the Spirit's leading because I know that my leading is going to be wrong. I can't do what I want because what I want is often what the flesh desires. Good works cannot save me. Obeying the laws of God cannot save me. It is grace alone by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Not to overuse a passage, 
but I probably do. I want to return to Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. If you've been around this church for more than a month or two, you've heard these words come out of my mouth. If you've been here for years, you've probably heard them dozens of times because I think that they do the best job of summing up the fact that salvation is not by works, but that works are the result of or the evidence of the actual salvation. So listen to what Paul writes. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the king of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. After reading this passage, I have prayed more than once, God, I have no hope outside of you, outside of your grace. I don't have water baptism or communion or anything to cling to, only my faith in the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ. You see, as a pastor of Friends Church, I hold to the truth. I've spoken more than once already this morning that no ritual can save you. Being baptized with water is useless if there is no genuine faith in Christ. Immersion doesn't matter at all if the Spirit does not live in you. If you have not repented of your sin, you're not forgiven, even if you've been dunked in water. The Spirit of God comes when individuals believe in Jesus and we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receive that baptism of fire when we believe on him. We may grow in him and we may find times when we sense his power and he changes us drastically, but the baptism of the Spirit is when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and he moves into our hearts and he changes us. We become a new creation. That's all that matters. If somebody wants to be baptized uh, with water as a sign of repentance, as a public declaration of a changed allegiances, as a witness to their death to sin, after putting their faith in Jesus, then by all means, let's go find a lake. Water baptism, when accompanied by a testimony and a transformed life, is a strong argument for the good news. It invites others to come to Jesus and be saved. Now, some of you have been baptized with water, most likely. You, you likely remember that day well. Perhaps when you think of it, tears come to your eyes because you remember the passion you had for Jesus then. And your faith was new and alive and you were excited about him. Praise God. Praise God and keep living for him. Seek him with the same fervor that you did then. Give yourself completely to stay in step with the spirit of God within you. And those of you who haven't been baptized with water, do all that too. All right, one more section from Matthew chapter 3. In the final verses of this chapter, we're going to witness the baptism of Jesus himself. Yes, he was immersed in water by John. Let's read Matthew's record of that. We're looking at verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. John's baptism. What was it a sign of? Repentance, right? It was the way that many in that day said, I'm leaving sin behind to follow God. Did Jesus have any sin to confess? Nope. He had no reason to repent. He was guilty of no wrongdoing. He had not transgressed any law of God. 
This is why John argues with Jesus about needing baptism and tells Jesus, I need yours, you don't need mine. He says, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? So then why does John go ahead and baptize Jesus? It's because of what Jesus says in response. Listen to Jesus' words again. He says in verse 15, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. What does Jesus mean by this? Why does water baptism matter when he doesn't have anything to repent of? His purpose was, as we hear him say, his purpose was to fulfill all righteousness. He's doing all that might have been required of a sinner to be made right before God. He was doing this so that when a person believes on him for salvation, all the requirements of law have been satisfied by him, and the righteousness the person receives by faith is sufficient to justify them before God because he's fulfilled it all. Paul speaks of this righteousness that we gain through faith in Christ. He speaks of the justification that it brings to us And here are a few of his words from Romans chapter 3. I'm reading verses 21 to 26. Romans 3, 21 to 26 says this, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Righteousness, that's a big fancy word for having a right standing with God, right? Righteousness is given to those whose faith is in Jesus. That righteousness is available because Jesus fulfilled all righteousness, leaving nothing undone. His baptism is credited to those who believe. His sinless life is credited to those who believe. His death pays the penalty for sin for all who would believe. We are saved because Jesus was perfectly righteous in every way. And because his perfect righteousness is credited to us when we believe on him. That's the truth. We are made righteous in Christ by faith. Praise hallelujah. One more thing before we go. I mentioned at the beginning of this message that we were going to learn truth about who Jesus is. God the Father says plainly in the final verse of this chapter, in verse 17, he says, This is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased. Jesus is the Son of God. And God is well pleased with his Son. These words of acceptance and pleasure are also recorded in Mark and in Luke. We worship and obey and put our faith in the Son of God, the only one who can fulfill all righteousness and justify us before God. With all who believe, with those who have been made righteous by faith, God is well pleased because we have the righteousness of Christ. This is the spiritual reality that we live in no matter what we believe concerning the use of water in baptism or how you should be baptized or what means or whatever. We submit to God and follow him by faith. We repent of our sin, confessing it to God. He forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what it says in 1 John 1, 9, right? All unrighteousness. We seek the Spirit's leading in all things and his power to obey. We do all the good that he created us to do in Christ Jesus as evidence of what he's done in our hearts. I trust that you've been encouraged today. I hope you have been. All the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in Christ. So you, who have put your faith in him, are set free. Set free from the condemnation of the law and given the power to live for God and to be in right relationship with him. That's the good news. What we couldn't do, Christ has done. And by faith in him, we're made righteous. We have a right standing with God. We can be in relationship with him. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy toward us. We thank you that you sent Jesus to fulfill all righteousness and that by faith in him, all righteousness is fulfilled in us. 
that we have the righteousness of Christ and that the work of Christ is credited to us, that his, the penalty for sin has been paid. And though we often live by the flesh instead of by the Spirit, we're counted righteous in your sight because of what Jesus did for us. God, that's our only hope. We turn away from our sin and we turn to you because we want to be a part of your kingdom. God, make us righteous. You know, we know that you've done that if we confessed our sins to you and put our faith in Jesus. But make us more and more like him. Help us to live like him this week, wherever we go. Whatever controversies we face, whoever is the president, whatever happens, God, we put, fix our eyes on Jesus and him alone. And we thank you for the work that you did, that Jesus has done for us. We thank you that your love sent him so that we didn't have to perish, but that we could have eternal life. We pray these things in his name, his holy and precious name. Amen. Well, let me close with just a few words from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. What I'm reading is is from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 to 20. It says this, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Let me say that again. He has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Wherever we go, as though God were making his appeal through us, We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So friends, go out, enjoy today, knowing that your faith in Christ has made you righteous. Thank him daily for the wonderful gift that he's given you and live in the power of the Spirit who makes you more and more and more like Jesus. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.